Right, well, I think we should probably start. Um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, joint meeting of the Hellenic and Roman Societies. Um, nearly missed by both uh, presidents, uh, thanks to the intervention of Network Rail. Um, <laughs> we, we both spent a very long time on a train today. Uh, fortunately, uh, one of our speakers is from London and two others were on the East Coast main line, so we are able... Uh, to proceed. And I'm, I'm personally very pleased about that because I find this subject uh, extremely interesting myself. Uh, our relationship with animals has uh, throughout history been a very complex and important one and uh, continues to be so. And uh, the animals in the ancient world and in the ancient classical world is a huge and very varied topic. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to be able to uh, start off this series of three talks um, by introducing Professor Malcolm Heath of the University of Leeds, formerly of Wadham, and and Merton. And Hertford <laughs> Colleges, Oxford, um, but uh, long now of, of Leeds. Um, and he's going to uh, speak about uh, anim uh, a particularly interesting area to me, it was animal speech, not all beasts are dumb, communication, intelligence, and Aristotle's animals. Thanks, Malcolm. Okay, I apologise for the extremely boring handout, uh, which is all text, uh, the PowerPoint, which is all text. Uh, but that first page sh sets out my agenda. So, um, do Aristotelian animals have the power of speech? By which I mean specifically language. Well, some of them do. Take, for example, me. I'm speaking to you now. I'm a human being. And in Aristotle's taxonomy, humans are animals. Humans then are animals, and they do have language. But what about Aristotelian animals that are not human? Do they have the power of speech? No. Many non-human animals produce sounds. They vocalise, but they are speechless. But that doesn't mean that these speechless animals are just dumb beasts in either sense of the word. Many of them are vocal and many of them are clever. And it's the communication and the intelligence of non-human animals from an Aristotelian perspective that I will be talking uh, about this evening. So, first of all, what is distinctive about speech? Aristotle distinguishes several grades of animal noise. First, there is sophos. Noise, sound, um, that includes, for example the noise that insects make when they rub their, their wings together. Now, secondly, there is phonair, voice, which is produced by the pharynx, so only animals that have lungs have this kind of uh, vocalisation. And this kind of vocalisation is, at least in many cases, significant. So voice brings us to the borderlines of meaningful communication. Thirdly, there's dialectos, which is sound articulated by the tongue. We humans are physiologically well equipped for this. Um, the flexibility and the sensitivity of the human tongue enables pre very precise vocal articulation as well as giving us a, an acute sense of, of taste. And the human teeth also play their, their role in that articulation. So articulate vocalisation is a human characteristic, but it's not unique, because birds are also capable of articulate, articulate vocalisation. What is genuinely unique to humans is logos, language, but also reason. And what does that give us? Well, we can do philosophy. 
We can grasp what it is for something to be, for example, a monkey in a way that the monkey itself can't do. We can reason and we can therefore make inferences. We can apply our ability to reason to practical matters. We can deliberate about what we're going to do in the future. And when we deliberate, we show that we are able to think about the future. And those are things that our nature equips us to do, at least potentially. Infant humans have a potentiality for language and for all those other human capacities, but that potential hasn't yet been realised. And it may never be fully realised if the child has some severe impairment. In fact, Aristotle reports there are some, that there are some distant non-Greek peoples who are without reason. They are, they are alog alogistoi. So they live by perception alone, he says, like non-human animals. But those are exceptional. Humans, by nature, are animals equipped for reason and language and deliber deliberation and anticipation of the future. And other animals are not. So how do those non-human animals manage without these human capacities? Let's start then with communication. The vocalisations of non-human animals may be communicative. Specifically, they use those vocalisations to communicate about significant things in their environment, pleasant or distressing. Aristotle's often uh, misreported as saying that non-human animals only communicate their pleasure or distress. On that view, the vocalisations would really be um, primarily expressive rather than communicative. Of course it's true that an alarm call does convey information about the caller's affective state, but that's incidental. The function of the alarm call um, or in Aristotle's wonderful terminology, he can turn anything into a noun by sticking a definite article. The for the sake of which the alarm call is to alert others to the presence of a threat. And probably also to the type of, of threat. If, if, if a generic alarm call is no use to you if you're a vervet monkey, because you have different predators, leopards, snakes, uh, eagles, and they require different evasion strategies. And therefore, the alarms have to be differentiated to tell you what the threat is and, and what you therefore should be doing. Aristotle's recognition that alarm calls are functional and referential, and I'm using term, a term here which emerged in modern animal studies, I think in the 1990s, functional referentiality as a way of understanding animal communication is quite new, but also very old, because Aristotle got there first. Um, and his recognition of this is evident in a comment on the vocalisations given by the leader of a flock of sleeping cranes. When he perceives something, he gives a signal by calling. Now we're used, to being told, we're used to being told that, according to Aristotle, humans are by nature political animals. Or perhaps we're more used to being told that man is a political animal, but that's a mistranslation. He uses the non-gender specific word anthropos. So humans are political animals by nature. But again, they're not unique in that respect. In respect. Um, so what does Aristotle mean when he describes any animal, human or non-human, as political? Animals are political if the group has a single activity in common. 
though to satisfy that criterion, it's not enough that the animals in the group are all doing the same thing in the way that a bunch of sheep might all be grazing in the, in the field. Um, but they're all doing it independently. Imagine a group of nosy people. <laughs> if one of them spots something interesting and starts looking at it, it's likely that another will notice and start looking as well. And eventually, all the nosy people will be looking at the same thing. <laughs> now, that's an example of what we might call uncoordinated gregariousness. We end up with an aggregate of individuals looking in the same direction. So in one sense, they're all doing the same thing, but there's no sense in which looking is a common activity of the group as a whole. By contrast, in a politically gregarious group, we would expect individual looking to serve a common, communal goal, such as group security. And that would not necessarily be something that's done by all members of the group. In a politically gregarious group, there can be a division of labour. Remember the cranes. A migrating flock has a leader who acts as lookout when the flock is asleep. But also Aristotle says when the, the cranes are in flight, signallers are positioned to keep, keep the flock together. So um, a social group with a communal goal and a division of labour is um, political. Aristotle takes the political organisation of cranes as a sign of their intelligence. Bees also are political and intelligent. So are other social insects, such as wasps and ants. Though interestingly, Aristotle makes a further distinction between hegemonic social insects, such as bees and wasps, that have a, um, a leader, a king, in Aristotle's uh, terminology, um, or, like the cranes, have a leader. But ants are leaderless. So Aristotle recognises anarchy as a viable form of political organisation. Aristotle is very interested in differences between animal species in their ways of living and their patterns of behaviour. And the way that patterns of behaviour are suited to the um, environmental niche and the physiology of the animal. Everything fits together neatly. At the beginning of his inquiries into animals, the Historia Animalium, he distinguishes gregarious from solitary animals. Then gregarious and solitary animals are both further subdivided into political and uncoordinated. And the political ones may have a leader or be leaderless. On the face of it, it may seem paradoxical that there could be animals that are both political and solitary. But what Aristotle has in mind is that there are animals that don't aggregate in extended social groups. But they do form reproductive partnerships and may have a prolonged association um, with their offspring, so where both parents contribute to the ongoing rearing of the, the, uh, the infant. And Aristotle describes that as being somewhat political. Uh, and in the early chapters of the politics, he argues that that kind of basic family group is the seed from which the polis ultimately developed. So, political groupings begin in the family. Aristotle recognises that many non-human animals communicate, that many of them form complex social groups, as we've just seen, and that there is huge diversity and flexibility in their forms of life. And he's willing to describe these animals as intelligent. And yet he denies that they have the distinctive kind of intelligence that's uniquely human. 
abstract thought, inferential reasoning, practical deliberation, awareness of the future. So how do the non-human animals manage to do complex, sophisticated, seemingly intelligent things without the advantages of being human? How do they manage to be clever? Well, they exist in an environment that is information rich. And perception, as Aristotle understands it, can be very rich indeed, since an animal's perceptual capacities enable it to access the environment's in informational riches. And of course, each animal species, its perceptual capacities are suited to that species needs. In the 1980s, James Gibson developed um, an ecological theory of perception. And as with re functional referentiality, I think Aristotle um, got there first. There, there are real similarities between Gibson and Aristotle. The Gibson didn't know that. He got Aristotle totally wrong. Um, <laughs> perception. Perception is a form of cognition, a form of knowing. It is cognition of particulars, that is, we perceive this thing here and now, and it's factual cognition in the sense that we perceive that this thing is so. But we don't perceive the why. There's no causal understanding involved in perception, no explanatory component. That is the preserve of reasoning. Some living organisms don't have perception at all. Plants don't. They don't need it. But animals do need it because they have a capacity for self-directed movement. If they are to direct their movements appropriately, they need to be able to detect significant features of the environment at a distance. And not even at a distance, at a very primitive level. If you try to detach a sponge from the object to which it's attached, the sponge will react to that unwelcome tactile stimulus by, by resisting, by holding on to its, its, its object. Uh, so every animal has to have the sense of touch. That's the basic sense. The minimum perceptual requirement for being an animal is that you are able to acquire information about current events that impinge directly on your body. But some of us aspire to being more than a sponge. Your life, <laughs> your life will be much richer if you're capable of self-directed movement from place to place. And for that, you need sense modalities that operate at a distance. If responding to stimuli with which you're not in immediate contact is important to your survival, then you need smell or hearing or sight or any combination of the above. Of course, you'll use your capacity to move from place to place in order to distance yourself from nasty things and get closer to nice things. Away from predators, closer to food. And perception is what discriminates between pleasant and distressing stimuli and thereby motivates pursuit or avoidance. Aristotle describes perception as a critical fact, um, faculty. It's a capacity for the cognition of positive or negative value relative to the organism's needs. If an organism has perception, it also has desire, and Aristotle maintains that pleasure and distress, desire and aversion, these aren't distinct from the perceptual capacity, they're built into it.
We've already seen examples of what Aristotle regards as intelligence or cleverness in cranes and in social insects. He's many more examples. Deer give birth to roads, near to roads, because fear of humans will keep predators at a distance, which is clever, if, if it's true, which I doubt. Um, what Aristotle tells us about methods of hunting deer is also quite bizarre. Spiders that create webs and use them to catch and store food have a, a kind of technical cleverness. Bird species that build nests and in which a breeding pair cooperates over the care of the young, they're singled out for their intelligence, which, as we've seen, involves political intelligence. Intelligence comes in different degrees. Aristotle thinks that sheep are simple-minded because they do things that put them at risk, like wandering away from the flock or not seeking shelter in a storm. But by and large, non-human animals interact with their environment in sophisticated, adaptable, or rather adaptive ways. Their interactions are such as will suit the animal's well-being. Aristotle says that people attribute practical wisdom to animals that are observed to have a forethought-ish capacity about their own lives. And yet, as I said earlier, he maintains that non-human animals can't think about or anticipate the future. He states explicitly in parts of animals that only humans have anticipation or expectation, cost or kia, of the future. So how could they possibly have forethought? But Aristotle is very precise. He doesn't say that they have forethought, but they have a capacity that is some way like, like forethought. A capacity that isn't forethought, but is within, is within limits um, functionally equivalent to it. Since non-human animals don't have causal understanding, this forethought-ish capacity has to rely on perception alone. It can't involve any rational grasp of the why. Incidental, uh, omitting um, anticipation, incidentally, from the list of non-human animal capacities isn't as strange as it may seem at first thought. There are many processes in living organisms that are directed towards a future goal of which the organism is unaware. And that's necessarily the case with plants because they don't have any awareness. Animals do have awareness, but they don't need to be aware of their behaviour's function. It's for the sake of which. Their behaviour may be driven by immediate motivating factors distinct from the behaviour's ultimate function. Consider an animal engaged in sexual intercourse. It is motivated by a pleasurable tactile stimulus in the present, it's oblivious to what, for Aristotle, is the ultimate function of reproduction, which is to secure a share in eternity and divinity. To explain how non-human animals can be clever simply through the resources of perception, without the aid of intellect or reason, Aristotle needs an account of perception that is rich enough to explain observed animal behaviours. <laughs> and I'm going to mention, quite briefly, um, four resources that enable him to develop such an account. First, what is it that perception perceives? Consider sight. Well, that perceives colours and shapes. The colours and shapes don't motivate an animal. There must be something about this combination of colour and shape that makes it in some way significant to the animal that perceives it. And Aristotle calls that significant combination an incidental object of perception. So there is a sense in which sight just sees colours and shapes, but actually see sight incidentally sees more than that in the colours and shapes. A rabbit doesn't away, run away because it's seen a coloured shape in the sky, 
runs away because that coloured shape is perceived as danger. Secondly, perception leaves traces in the mind. Though Aristotle has a less static terminology, it leaves a process, an ongoing process, a kinesis in the animal. Uh, he calls it uh, an image, phantasma. Retained images provide an animal with a kind of reference library. If the coloured shape that the animal has just seen is very like an image that's still persisting in the animal, an, Im an image that scared the animal, then the animal will, will be motivated to run away. Thirdly, images may be lodged more permanently in memory, providing a less transient store of information that accumulates within the animal. Not all animals have memory, but those that do, have, they have greater practical intelligence than those that don't. So memory gives you a step up. And then fourthly, some animals are capable of integrating multiple memories. Aristotle's term for this is experience, emperia. Memory can tell an animal that this previously encountered object is dangerous. Experience enables an animal that has accumulated multiple memories of similar encounters to identify contextually appropriate responses. Animals can learn from experience and acquire new behaviours. So that's why animal trainers um, have uh, can make a good living. They exploit that feature of animal cleverness. So the perceptual system as Aristotle understands it is a critical faculty. It's integrated with pleasure and distress, desire and aversion. It extends to incidental objects of perception. It preserves perceptual content so that animals can act on information that's not currently perceived. And by integrating the deposit of multiple perceptions, it can introduce a degree of flexibility into an animal's behavioural repertoire. So Aristotelian animals are not simply are not simple automata. Perception enriched in these ways is capable of sustaining complex and analogically intelligent behaviours. And if you think back to the beginning, where I mentioned those distant non-Greek peoples who have failed to actualize their natural potentiality for reason, it's perhaps worth reflecting in the light of what I've been saying about the intelligence of non-human animals, that hum the lives of those humans may have been richer than we would instinctively imagine. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.